solved the issue of needing to replace their Pacifics with more powerful locomotives, some by enlarging the 462 arrangement into 464 Hudson types, with an additional trailing axle to accommodate a larger firebox, as did the Santa Fe and the Penzi's rival New York Central, and others, like the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific, into 482 Mountains with an additional pair of driving wheels. The Hudson type was a really good passenger locomotive, able to haul longer trains at faster speeds that Pacifics couldn't, while some mountain types were either particularly meant for the same work as Hudson's, or just as good at pulling heavy freight trains as they were pulling heavy passenger trains at high speed, making them excellent mixed traffic locomotives. Other mountain types, though, were exclusively meant for pulling freight. Those locomotive types would later be enlarged into 484 Northerns following the invention of the type by the Northern Pacific Railroad in 1926. But the way the Pennsylvania Railroad went about replacing the K4 is nothing short of way too questionable. Because instead of just simply enlarging the design into a 464 Hudson, or even into a 482 Mountain, or even a 484 Northern, or simply just buying more M1As, they simply just countered the issue by simply making a locomotive that was essentially a scaled-up K4, hoping that that would fix the issue. Two of such Pacifics were manufactured in 1929, the first, 5698, at Juniata Shops, and the second, 5699, by Baldwin. Although both referred to as K5s, they were still a bit different from one another. The Juniata locomotive 5698 was equipped with standard Walshirts valve gear and 243.21 kilonewtons of tractive effort. The Baldwin product 5699 with Caprati valve gear and tractive effort of 258.41 kilonewtons. 5698 also used a conventional single cast locomotive frame, longer smoke box with the feed water mixing chamber in front of the stack and the generator mounted on the right side below the stack and separate cylinder plus half saddle castings. Everything else between the K5s was the same. 203.2 centimeter driving wheels, 686 millimeter by 762 millimeter cylinders, and so on. 
the boilers of these things were much fatter than those of the K4s, and similar in size to the company's I-1S 210O decapods. With the exception of the 203.2 centimeter driving wheels and brake area, every other dimension of the K5 was just an enlarged K4. But they didn't really have much more weight on their driving wheels as a result. 104.125 US tons of the K5s versus the K4s 99.75 US tons. One US ton is 2,000 pounds, by the way, or for all my metric system users, about 94.5 and 90.5 metric tons, respectively. The lack of extra adhesive weight caused them to have a terrible adhesion factor of just 3.8, which is unacceptable for a steam locomotive. You want to have an adhesive factor of 4.0 or more on a steam locomotive so that it gets enough grip on the rails and doesn't slip so easily. The K5s had more tractive effort and horsepower than the K4s, but their lack of additional adhesive weight made them prone to violent wheel slip on heavy trains. It severely affected their ability to haul trains heavier than what a K4 could handle alone. The wheel slip issue usually cropped up when the train was too heavy, and by that, a train that a K4 also couldn't manage. The K4s lacked the power, but they had plenty of traction and a good adhesive factor of 4.54. The K5s had all the power needed for heavy trains unassisted, but not enough adhesion to effectively utilize it. Consequently, the locomotives, thanks to the lack of additional adhesion, were limited by themselves to only being able to handle passenger trains that were the same weight as what a K4 could. There was no improvement over the K4s at all, their power meant frickin' nothing. As a result of it, 482s and 484s, which had more driving wheels, thus resulting in more adhesive weight to increase adhesion, were considered preferable to locomotives as powerful as the K5. And I'm sure a Hudson type like those of the New York Central or CNW also might be as well. Penzi didn't really need to waste money on the Civics that were bigger than the K4s. They could have just scaled the K4 up, not into a larger Pacific, but into a much longer and larger 464 Hudson, as did its rival company, the New York Central, and that would have solved the problem just fine, just like it did for the New York Central. In fact, the Pennsylvania Railroad's GT1s of 1934 were in fact based on the New York Central's P motors, except of course with streamlining and overhead pantograph lines for overhead wires. They could have also just made more M1A mounts, which were meant for both passenger and freight service, and could do the work that the K4s were struggling to do unassisted. Or they could have even made a second version of the M1A, more suited for passenger service, perhaps the fictional M M2, for example. It was 1929 after all, just three years after the Northern Pacific had invented the 484 Northern type, which was enlarged from the 482 Mountain and 464 Hudson's. That would have been an excellent way to solve Penzi's problems. So now I know what you're thinking. What? Why? Why didn't the Penzi just replace the game force with what you suggested? Well, like I said, it was 1929 after all when they finally started getting to work on replacing the K4s with the K5s. But unfortunately, the Great Depression then came, which caused locomotive production, especially in junior shops, to cease. Following the completion of the K5s and the final batch of M1As, the electrification of the Northeast Corridor also displaced many surplus steam locomotives east of Harrisburg to the rest of the non-electrified parts of the Pennsylvania Railroad's network. And so, they simply just used those surplus steam locomotives and double-headed them in passenger trains to pick up. The problem, though, is that double-heading and triple-heading means that you not only have to add extra locomotives in, but you also have to pay extra locomotive bills and extra maintenance staff, plus multiplying your operating costs, which is a lot more expensive than just using a single or massive steam locomotive, like Norfolk and Western 611 over there, or that M1A, as opposed to just using a few smaller locomotives to do the job, because you only have to pay one crew, and you're not cutting corners in the process. Cough. PSR. Because the K4s were now having to doublehead or even tripplehead so often, coupled with being misused via hauling freight, operating costs loaded up on the Penzi, even when they had enough money during World War II to try again when it came to replacing the K4 as its premier passenger locomotive, this time with the 4444T1 duplexes. The T1s worked a lot better than the K5s despite their poppet valve gear and crews not being used to their amazing power, but by the time they arrived in 1942, the Penzi had lost a lot of money from the Depression and wasted just as much double-heading and triple-heading the K4s as well as other smaller locomotives so often. 
the T1 service lives were cut so short by diesels that it wasn't enough time to completely replace the K4s and thus saving enough money for the Panzee. In fact, the frequent double-headers and triple-headers between K4s up to that point, followed by declining ridership after World War II, had gotten the Pennsylvania Railroad into a really bad financial status starting in 1946. It was specifically due to this deteriorating financial status that caused the scrapping of the S1 duplex, and perhaps what ultimately prevented the Penzi from having the money to prevent the extinction of other locomotive types they had, like the T1, R1, so many more, despite being pretty kind to preservation. So, if they had gotten around to start replacing the K4s a little sooner than they did before the Depression hit, and had instead chose, say, a 464 Hudson design, enlarged with the K4, a 484 Northern design, or just built more M1s in time, or I dare say, first, then any of these designs would have likely had no problem replacing the K4s as the PRR's premier passenger locomotives, maybe even the entire fleet of 425, if they managed to make enough in time. It would have saved them a lot of money in the long run, and by the post-World War II days and into the late 1950s, the company would have been in better financial shape and would have been able to save more steam locomotives, if that was their thoughts, perhaps a larger variety, maybe even the S1 like originally planned, maybe at least a single T1, alongside the number of types of steam, diesel, and electric locomotives they already saved in real life. And think about it this way, if a T1 was saved, there'd be no need for a T1 trust to resurrect the class from extinction. They could then just instead resurrect a different model of American steam locomotives, like the New York Central Hudson's get the project in motion, and make the promising progress of one day resurrecting them from the dead, just like they are the T1 right now. Since the Penzi actually replacing the K4s in time still wouldn't change anything about Alfred E. Perlman choosing to scrap all the New York Central Hudsons, since he felt it would make his company look old and outdated. Alongside a few other reasons, as well, financially speaking, to kind of quote history in the dark on that. Not to mention the number of people who failed to get a new Hudson build in motion over the decades, but yeah, I've proven my point. As for the K5s, they spent the rest of their lives hauling passenger trains of similar size to those of the K4s between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, later the Harrisburg-Baltimore, and Pittsburgh to Crestline routes. The reason being that some other aspects of them performed fine, as long as the trains they pulled were the same size of what a K4 could handle alone, even if their power meant frickin' nothing. 5699 eventually had its Caprati gear replaced with more reliable Walshard's valve gear in 1937, and both locomotives were given post-war makeovers just like the K4s after World War II. They were withdrawn and scrapped between 1952 and 53. Unsurprising given the fact they sucked, and should have been mountains or northerns instead if they had any chance of being good enough to be saved, let alone enough to replace the K4s like they should have. Although there is no video sponsor today, the footage of me talking in front of all those mostly Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotives was filmed with a bit of wind and public, but no staff interruption, at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, located right next door to the Strasburg Railroad in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. The museum is home to a lot of historic locomotives, including the vast majority of preserved Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotives, a few diesels and electrics, as well as many more common and unique locomotives and rolling stock that once served in the state of Pennsylvania. They are dedicated to maintaining and preserving their equipment as a reminder and tool of education to future generations of what railroading was like back in the day, along with what some now artifacts came out of it. A link in their website is in the description below, and the place itself is amazing. I highly recommend paying a visit, whether or not you're just a simple history buff, for a casual rail fan like me.
trapped in the dust and struggle. Especially if you do not want to end up like the Pennsylvania Railroad did as a result of not replacing the K4s in time as their premier passenger locomotive. I'm launching the K4 into a large Pacific type simply isn't going to work, especially when you're keeping the same wheelbase. But launching it into a Hudson or Mountain type will work. And I'm not the only one who did it. Your partner, Roman Western, did it too, and they got away just fine. Think, Pennsylvania, think! Uh, dude, we were just experimenting. We like our traditions. We were just trying to do it with a, with a shorter Pacific type. Just so it could fit our traditions a little more. Maybe fit a little better into our infrastructure and our standards. And also not put as much weight on the track. Also, we hate you. Well, it doesn't matter! Neither does it to your partner, Republican Western! Your solution is short-term and old-school! Ours is long-term and new! Your partner knows how to change for the better, and so keep some traditions you do not! You need to learn how to change, especially your standards! And I will still hate you just as much as anyway! Ah! In the... Why?